So uh, today I'll be talking about this uh, Zeeman spectroscopy. Uh, I'm just using uh, the, uh, the slides which are, which are already there in the website. So, uh, this, these are all slides from Professor Deshmukh's course and I have not altered it. I just introduced a couple of labels for convenience. That's it. So it's all available. Uh, uh, I hope I will do justice to this. Uh, for, there's a lot of information and uh, a lot of effort uh, is gone in preparing this uh, lecture. See, I had taught Zeeman spectroscopy a couple of times for students and both the times the my emphasis was mostly on degenerate perturbation theory, treating Zeeman spectroscopy as an example. Okay, but what you will see in this lecture is Professor Deshmukh has beautifully uh, brought, out, brought out the underlying fundamental concepts in quantum mechanics, which are linked to Zeeman spectroscopy, such as mm -hmm. the transformation, symmetry transformations, or the degeneracy due to symmetry operations. Uh, de degenerate, uh, degeneracy due to symmetry in the Hamiltonian and how an external perturbation which will break this symmetry will lead to uh, lifting of this degeneracy and on through this he also introduces uh, the couple of very important powerful tools such as the flex quadrant coefficients and the uh, big neck cast theorem and so we will see these uh, so mostly we, I mean, I have been using this uh, uh, teaching Zeeman spectroscopy, as I mentioned, as an example for degenerate perturbation theory, but there is so much of underlying concept that has to be, which are linked to this, which we can uh, convey to the students and uh, make it more deeper. Uh, this we will realize in this uh, uh, lecture, see, lecture. So as I mentioned, there can, there can be several transformations. You can have rotational transformation. You can have inversion, which will do, uh, which will uh, inversion about the origin, or we can have several combinations. The question is, what does what do these transformations do to your Hamiltonian? Do they change your Hamiltonian or not? There may be some transformations which leave the Hamiltonian unchanged. So we call that symmetry. Those are symmetry operations. So those which leave the Hamiltonian invariant under those transformations. For example, if you take a simple harmonic oscillator with the minimum with a simple harmonic potential in one dimension with the minimum at the origin so then you know if you do an inversion if you change x to minus x what what you have is there is no change in the potential energy so there is a parity is the parity inversion of trans transformation leads to this parity uh, which is a symmetry operator in this case it does not do anything to the hamiltonian the hamiltonian which is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy remains unchanged. So that is that is what we call a symmetry operation. And I will we will see what it leads to. There are fundamental properties that uh, the symmetry will uh, uh, th th that symmetry has. So transformations can be anything rotation inversion, but only those which leave the Hamiltonian invariant is is what we are interested in. They are the symmetry operators. If you have uh, a group a large number of symmetry operations like which are R1, R2, and so on. And uh, if they all commute with the Hamiltonian, that means if they leave the Hamiltonian invariant, then we call this, uh, we, we can call this as a group of Schrodinger equations. All these are all the groups of symmetry operators that system has, symmetry operations that the system possesses. Why do we do this? The, if you identify the symmetry of the system, it actually, uh, makes your job much more easy. You, you are just uh, what remains is you are almost half the work is done when you when you want to find the eigenstate of the system. Okay, so half the work is done if you know the symmetry of the uh, uh, system. So if you have say R i, which is a symmetry operation, which is which commutes with H, you know that both can be simultaneously diagonalized because when they both commute with each other. And hence, if you know the eigenstates of the symmetry operator, then you know the eigen, you, there is a possibility to find out the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian system. If you remember that not all the eigenstates of the symmetry operator will be eigenstate of Hamiltonian, but of course there is a scope to uh, find uh, the, Hamilton, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So the group theory uh, uh, and the, the geometry of the system, that is the properties of transformations, give you a lot of information about the uh, quantum mechanical aspects of the system. So the, 
if you if you if you have a hamiltonian uh, ex a hamiltonian expressed as a matrix in uh, in the eigen basis of a symmetry operator say r then you know that um, you, you can show very easily that the ha matrix the hamiltonian will not have um, the the matrix element of the hamiltonian will, will vanish if you have uh, it evaluated between two eigen states of a symmetry operator with different eigen value this is very simple to show this is what we see here so if we have ri which is a symmetry operator that commutes with the hamiltonian and if you represent this is an operator the commutation operator is an operator and this if you evaluate in the matrix the eigen basis of as a matrix in the eigen basis of r uh, the symmetry operator then it is easy to show that this uh, the hij which is the matrix element of the hamiltonian between ri eigen ket of r eigen ket ri and eigen ket rj this will be zero if these two uh, the, if ri r i a minus r j j is non zero okay so what you need to do is the following you just have to search for the eigen states of the symmetry operator with different eigen values once you are once you do that you are you are very close to the uh, problem that is of identifying the eigen states of the hamiltonian we have already done this in the class i just wanted to show you this it's not new to us when you take this one dimensional uh, problem of a simple harmonic oscillator for the scoring the equation the time independent scoring the equation for this problem is If psi is for the energy eigen case, then this we know. And when it, when we try to, we know that there are two ways to solve this to get the eigen states of the simple harmonic oscillator. One is the operator approach, and the other one is the wave function approach. In the wave function wave function approach, what you do is you express this with uh, eigen states. as l power series and then you would substitute this in this equation i'm just try, i'm not getting into details but i'm just trying to get to the essentialities so you would substitute this in this equation and you will get the various uh, coefficients once you get the various coefficients you have already solved for the wave function okay when you do this what you would find is that the coefficients are related in the following fashion the even coefficients are actually Related to C naught, where C naught is the coefficient of V C naught is a constant in this experiment. Uh, v C naught is the coefficient of x power zero in this series, and you will realize the odd coefficients are related to the g and n or some functions of n are related to C one. Well, now you think that you have solved the problem because you have already got this uh, solved, but only two things are unknown. once you know c not you know all the even coefficients when you know once you know c1 you know all the odd coefficients so you may be happy yes i have found the uh, entire solution for this eigen state but the answer is no because you have two unknowns which are c which is c not and c1 okay now the problem is if you had just one unknown you could have get get rid of it by just normalizing this wave function and then say that yes I, I know uh, C not right? because the not this has to be normalized. So I can I can actually work, uh, find out one of the unknown. But we have two unknowns here. How did we solve this problem? We use the symmetry of this problem. That is, we if you if you do an inversion about origin, that is, if v of if you consider v of minus x, the potential energy is same for v of x. And this tells you that we. a parity operator is a eigen state of the hamiltonian of this hamiltonian and hence the parity uh, the eigen states of parity operator is going to be eigen uh, or can, can also be are the good candidates for the eigen state of the hamiltonian and hence we know that the what are the eigen states of parity operator they are the even and odd states now i know that the states have to be either even or odd so if i choose c1 to be zero then i get rid of all the odd components or 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 components of this expansion and when i get c not to zero 
I get rid of all the even components and I get the other parity equation. So this is what we do when we do when we solve this equation. That is, so we use the symmetry of the uh, problem and that helps us to solve the problem very efficiently. So this is what we need to appreciate here. So if it, there is another, the symmetry also leads to degeneracy. This we can see here, if we have a Hamiltonian operating on a wave function, eigen, uh, eigen wave function, if this is energy is given by E, then if you consider a symmetry operator PR, and uh, so P, let PR be operated on this coordinate equation. Since we, call, we, since we know that it's a symmetry operator, it is supposed to leave the Hamiltonian invariant, and hence uh, you can actually bring this uh, PR inside, so because they both commute, so what you see is not only psi n, which is, the, which is an eigen function of Hamiltonian with eigen value E, even PR psi n is also an eigen function of the Hamiltonian with the same eigen value E. So what we understand is that symmetry also leads to degeneracy. Okay, so we had first the transformation, then we went to symmetry, and then symmetry, the link between symmetry and degeneracy. Now, if we consider a hydrogen atom problem without, without considering any relative, non-relativistic hydrogen atom problem without any magnetic field, then there is a lot of, uh, the, 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 we have, it's, they said it is a central force, the Coulomb force is the central force there, and you have uh, uh, the, the force depends only on R, it is uh, not on theta and phi, and you have, Degeneracy because of this symmetry, because Hamiltonian is invariant under rotation in this case, and hence because of this, what you have is the 2s and 2p states are degenerate. So, suppose if you introduce an external perturbation, that is, you add a term, perturbing term to the Hamiltonian, which will break the symmetry, then the, you, there is a possibility to lift this degeneracy. This is, is what all about is uh, about the basic thing of this Zeeman effect. You are introducing a magnetic field, say along Z axis. So there is no symmetry, there is rotational invariant is no more there. It is, there is symmetry about the Z axis. So that you, lo you lost the symmetry and hence you lost this degeneracy. So that is what the Zeeman splitting is going to be. So you can either partially remove it or you may some, in some cases you can fully remove the, what I mean is, there are five states with same energy, there is five-fold degenerate. The a particular perturbation can leave uh, one of them, this, uh, two of them at the same level, and the other two can be raised or lower. So it can be partial lifting of degeneracy. And beauty is that, how do we find this de degeneracy being lifted? Well, the after, de after lifting, after the line split, we can still have transitions between the uh, split levels. So we can identify that. Now, initially I had just one line, now I have two lines or three lines, so that is a, that is a degeneracy being lifted. Oh, so that, that is an indication of the region. So we are, we, today we will talk three important um, cases of Zeeman effect. Normal, anomalous, and passion. There is nothing abnormal about anomalous. Uh, there is nothing normal about normal. And uh, everything is normal, but therefore historical reason. And uh, I will also... Uh, reserve the uh, comment on this for why we call it as normal and why the an an anomalous till we really get into the physics. But as of now, these th three different cases or the names for the three different cases are purely historical. And uh, normal effect, the so-called normal effects happen when you start, when you have strong fields. And anomalous is when you have weak fields. Passion and ba passion back effect is the intermediate fields. We'll discuss these cases in detail. Now, Zeeman found that the, the spectroscopic lines split in the presence of magnetic field. Now, let's see how this splitting will happen. Now, if you consider a mag magnetic field, it can be, it need not be uniform. It can be varying, but for a given dimen an atomic scale dimen dimension of the, uh, at, at, in atomic scale, you can consider it to be a uniform field. Though you have variation within the uh, dimensions of the atom, you can consider the magnetic, applied magnetic field to be uniform, and the vector potential can be represented as half B cross R, where A is the vector potential of the magnetic field, which is the applied external magnetic field, which is the B, B vector. Now, we know that in classical mechanics, Hamiltonian is given by uh, this expression, where P minus 
E A by C is called the general generalized momentum. This is the Hamiltonian of a charged particle in a magnetic field. We need to write down the Hamiltonian in this fashion so as so that we can get the Lorentz force correctly. So that the so that is this expression for the P is the momentum and P minus P minus E A by C is the generalized momentum. Now what do we do is when you want to someone is asking you why don't you write the Hamiltonian for a charged particle in a magnetic field we simply borrow things from classical mechanics. We just take this equation replace P with P operator A with A operator and see whether the results are uh, consistent with the experiment. So that's what we are going to do. So our this is going to be our Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics with P operator. Uh, P being replaced by the momentum operator which is minus I h bar del and A being a function of position operator. Now as you can see here we have to be very careful in quantum mechanics it is not just square of this operator we it is P dot this P minus E A by C operator dot P minus E A by C and we need to be careful because momentum and position do not commute with each other so we need to work, work out this very explicitly and we need not go into the details of this is easy to see because momentum operator is anyway minus i h bar del that's why you get this del here and uh, this term uh, in coulomb gauge vanishes so we can take divergence of a to be zero and uh, so this is what you get for this equation so finally with this your hamiltonian becomes the following that is this is your full time dependent scoring equation for a charged particle in magnetic field. So what you see here is the kinetic energy term, the potential energy term and two terms which are linear and quadratic in magnetic field and these come up because of the external magnetic field and we are supposed to solve this problem. Now we, we can uh, we can what we want to do now do is we have two terms on magnetic field which we, which is really making us uncomfortable let us just look look at these two things closely that as we see we want to evaluate the uh, relative strength of these two terms. Now if you consider this A dot del term A is the vector potential which is what is appearing here and I we just do a slight modification here by bringing this minus I h bar into this del so that we can see this identify this to be the momentum operator. So what you get is R cross P in classical mechanics R cross P is the uh, angular momentum R ve operator cross vector operator R cross product with momentum operator is going to give the angular momentum operator as Professor Deshpuk stressed many times angular momentum uh, we define angular uh, for us in quantum mechanics angular momentums are generators of rotations that is it they are not something about particles spinning or moving about. Um, uh, spinning about themselves or something like that. So, so if you compare this term, this particular term is A dot B, which R cross P is nothing but the angular momentum operator, which is L L operator. So you have B dot L. The angular momentum operator will be the order of angular momentum operator can will be the order of H bar, which is which has units of angular momentum as well. We may have two H bar. It, it, H bar is the order of magnitude. So we are just considering the order of magnitude of this linear term. When you do the same for the, uh, the for evaluating the order of magnitude for the quadratic term and uh, do a bit of mathematics and when you do this uh, take a ratio of quadratic to linear term what you find is a very small number multiplied with B. So you will see that quadratic terms become um, significant only in very large magnetic fields. So which are not achievable in lab. So we can very well uh, ignore the quadratic term in these expressions. You can just live with the linear term. Uh, so only at very since only at very large magnetic fields they, these become significant. So what I'm going to do, what we are going to do is just we are going to eliminate this uh, term in uh, the quadratic term and live with the remaining because the lab fields are weak. So this is what we have here. Now what we do is uh, we have identified the Hamiltonian to be this. Now we already have solved the hydrogen atom problem for kinetic energy with the Hamiltonian being the kinetic composed of kinetic energy and the potential energy. Now what we have in addition is this term due to the external magnetic field. So our Hamiltonian is now H naught which is the unperturbed Hamiltonian with a perturbation 
which is dependent on angular momentum and the external magnetic field, which is what we call it as HL uh, prime. Now, if you look at this, uh, this term, the perturbing Hamiltonian, we can do a, a rearrangement by uh, by identifying uh, we, by introducing a magnetic moment, uh, orbital magnetic moment, which we identify to be the uh, Bohr magneton times the angular op angular momentum operator by h bar. So, and where Bohr magneton is given by this expression e h bar by 2 m c. Once you do this, you can identify this perturbation perturbing Hamiltonian to be merely minus mu dot b. This is not a surprise because we know that when you have a dipole uh, kept in a magnetic field, it gets an energy, the potential energy is minus mu dot b, where mu is the di magnetic dipole. Okay, so this is the ex en energy of a magnetic dipole in an external magnetic field, which is a perturbing term in this case. So our uh, Schrodinger equation now looks like this. So you have this is a time dependent Schrodinger equation with the hydrogen atom unperturbed Hamiltonian plus this perturbing Hamiltonian. Now we are supposed to solve this equation. Now, what happened was when uh, when uh, Uhlenbeck, Uhlenbeck and Samuel uh, Goldsmith, when they when they did this experiment, they found that it is not sufficient to deal with this mu l, and there are other component sources for this magnetic moment of the atom, which they couldn't uh, really physically interpret. But with uh, they just in order to sub, in order to explain their physical physical uh, experimental results. They introduced an another source of magnetic moment, which they called as a spin uh, magnetic moment, in addition to this angular momentum magnetic moment. And but they don't have any expression uh, until we have the uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. Now, in the classical picture, um, when you when you have an electron uh, in motion, you can see that you can have you can ident you can identify this to be a current carrying loop. And uh, a magnetic moment can be associated with this, but this is a classical picture with not exact anal analogy to quantum mechanics because you cannot talk about R and P together, position and the momentum together. And uh, so, but, but this analogy, with this analogy, we can we can see that the magnet orbital magnetic moment is related to the uh, orbital angular momentum and the Bohr magneton with GL given by one. This is what we got in the previous slide. Now, with the direct, uh, with the with the relativistic quantum mechanics, we naturally uh, also get the spin magnetic another source for magnetic moment, which is the spin magnetic moment, which is all which is now related to the spin angular momentum. It is no way related to spin physical spin of electron. It is just an intrinsic quantity which naturally comes from the relativistic quantum mechanics. So the magnetic moment due to spin. Is directly proportional to the spin angular momentum, just like the magnetic moment due to orbital angular uh, mu l is directly proportional to the orbital angular momentum. But now here, you, the value for G s turns out to be two. This uh, is these these are discussed in in length where, and related to the in the in the course on relativistic uh, quantum in lectures in relativistic quantum mechanics by Professor Deshmukh. So what you have is a total magnetic moment which is composed of the Magnetic moment due to angular momentum and the spin angular uh, spin angular momentum orbital and the spin angular momentum. So total mu is given by L plus two s because G s is two. This is what is going to be our total mu. So your perturbing Hamilton the according a equation needs to be replaced instead of mu L you need to introduce mu dot p where mu includes both the magnetic moment due to orbital. Uh, angular momentum and spin angular momentum. Well, but you do, you have one more term here. What is that? Once you had introduced spin, when you agree to include spin, you also have to agree to including the effects of spin in terms of coupling uh, spin getting coupled with uh, the uh, orbital angular momentum. So when you do relativistic in quantum mechanics, uh, you, there is a spin orbit coupling ham a term which comes naturally in the Hamiltonian, which is given by Zeta of R uh, times S dot L, where S is the spin angular momentum, L is the orbital angular momentum. This term comes out in the uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, just as naturally as the magnetic uh, moment. Now, what we have before S is 
two uh, terms uh, which are in brown color here minus mu dot b plus zeta of r s dot l these two terms are going to be the perturbing term perturbation term now we need to handle this now in in the latest quantum mechanics this uh, spin orbit term is explicitly can be evaluated it is it is a function of r and that function of r is essentially a partial derivative of the coulomb potential with respect to r and this so this is the perturbing hamiltonian before us now we we, we are in position now to discuss three different cases of magnetic field one such one such that the magnetic field is such that the mu dot b term is much larger than this term second the spin orbit term so when you do that you can simply ignore this and do uh, your calculation treating this as the unperturbed ket and this is the perturbing hamiltonian this is the case when we have strong magnetic field so that mu dot b is much larger than this remember mu dot b is an external perturbation whereas the spin orbit coupling is an internal perturbation even if you do not have a magnetic field this perturbation is going to be there because it is just a consequence of spin and angular momentum which are intrinsic the second case is an intermediate case still mu dot b is larger than the spin orbit term but is not as larger in the as in the first case it's an intermediate case the third one is such that the external magnetic field is so low that the spin orbit term becomes significant okay now zeeman so the reason for discussing zeeman spectroscopy is that it actually uh, exposes you to rich uh, concept and uh, variety of concepts in quantum mechanics because in all these three cases we are essentially solving an eigen value problem but the choice of basis set is going to be different so you are going to learn a lot about wisely solving an eigen value problem as you go through these three cases now the hamiltonian as we saw can could be in, um, the perturbing hamilton could be internal as in the case of uh, the spin orbit uh, term and uh, and it can also be external because of external magnetic field so this is what uh, you can we, there are other other uh, important uh, internal uh, hamilton internal perturbations such as the hyperfine interactions because there are others which are mentioned in the lecture now in order now that we know the perturbing term the job is to find the eigen value that is the energy of the system under perturbations how do we do that we can take recourse to the first order perturbation theory now because of the symmetry of the system we have degeneracy so we need to take recourse to the um, degenerate perturbation theory so what you do here is to uh, the idea in the degen uh, degenerate perturbation theory is to diagonalize the perturbing hamiltonian in the basis of the unperturbed ket and in the basis of the unperturbed kets so if psi not is the unperturbed ket we know that the hamiltonian will lead to this is the scoring equation for psi not and uh, the energy shift is given by the matrix element of the perturbing hamiltonian in between psi not uh, when this is this is the shift in energy for the for a state psi not this is this is from the first order, first order perturbation theory now the question before us is okay uh, we can evaluate this energy shift by evaluating this matrix element but what are what is going to be the unperturbed ket in this case how what how do we choose this unperturbed ket there are two choices before us one with uh, a ket which is an eigen ket which, which has eigen values of hamiltonian l square lz and sz and the other set of corner numbers being uh, n l j and m where lz and sz are the z as a uh, component of the orbital and the spin angular momentum respectively j is the total angular momentum and jz is the component of the total angular momentum along the z axis now we have two bases in front of us we cannot just go blindly and use any one of them you don't get a wrong answer if you choose any of these but if you choose one of them the the right one you get the answer quickly and without much much of uh, work so i mean um, sakurai makes a comment if you, you you have to be if you choose a wrong you have to be a fool or a masochist to choose the wrong uh, uh, the basis you know what a masochist is uh, yeah the, i think griffith mentions this a sadist a masochist is someone who says please beat me sadist says i won't <laughs> so there is there is a choice between there are two choices one is this 
eigen eigen bases which is having which are eigen kits of lz and sz operators so we represent as ml ms bases the other one is jm bases which are eigen uh, values of j square and jz so we need to choose between them we will do that we will do that considering individual cases now if you consider these uh, three different cases normal bastian and anomalous zeeman effect in the normal zeeman effect we are going to uh, the magnetic field is strong enough so that the spin orbit coupling is rather very weak so what you have and of course we are discarding the quadratic component of the magnetic field now it turns out that it is easy to see that the appropriate choice of the un, uh, basis for the unperturbed kit has to be uh, the ml ms uh, eigen basis why because if you if you if this is the only perturbing term if your magnetic field b is along the z axis so what you have is this term is boils boils down to mu z b z okay and mu z is nothing but uh, 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 mu z has lz and sz in it mu z operator mu z has lz operator and sz operator in it and naturally lz sz basis is going to be a choice because they are eigen kits of lz and sz operator so you can easily diagonalize there is nothing you can just have to evaluate the eigen value and the matrix element in this basis it's going to be easy to it's just it is going to be diagonalized because they are eigen kits of sz sz operator so the choice is ml ms basis for the normal zeeman effect and not uh, the jm basis and hence we call it as good quanta numbers the other we call it good because they are they they, they favor us in evaluating quickly the others are bad in the sense they are not forbidden others are not forbidden basis but this is this makes life lot, lot more easier so the what we need to do is to evaluate this splitting in energy that means to evaluate this perturbing hamiltonian in ml and ms basis so we need to evaluate this particular matrix element this is very simple so how do we do that so we know that mu uh, is nothing but mu b l plus l operator plus 2 s operator by h bar now if the magnetic field which if the direction of the mag if you take a uniform magnetic field along a particular direction which is which we can call as the z direction then what you have is this b has just one component along the z direction so when you take a dot product what you get is mu b lz plus 2 sz by h bar and these are anyway eigen kits of lz and sz so finally what you get is this term so when you want to evaluate uh, the matrix element so when this is along uh, the uh, z direction so you have lz operating on this ml ms kit to give you ml h bar and 2s when it to uh, to twice the spin op uh, sz operator acting on this will give you 2 h bar so that is 2 m ms h bar so that's why you have this matrix element to be given by bohr magneton times ml plus 2 ms times b now with f now there is look at this the splitting actually depends on this combination ml plus 2 ms so there may be two different states with different ml and ms but both for both of them ml plus 2 ms can be the same number so what does that mean that means both will have same energy uh, both both will have same shift in energy so look at this combination for example so if you take ml equal to 1 ms equal to minus half this gives you ml plus 2 ms is zero that means this level undergoes no shift there is no shift for this term for this the particular state which is having ml equal to 1 and ms equal to minus half if you look at ml equal to minus 1 and ms equal to half the ml plus 2 ms is again zero that means for both these terms the delta e is zero all other st- other terms will have different delta e so that means there are two terms who are still having same energy in spite of introducing this perturbation so you have not lifted the degeneracy completely you have partially lifted it why did you lift how did you lift it because i introduced a external magnetic field which broke the symmetry earlier i had rotational hamiltonian was rotationally invariant but now it is not so so this uh, there are two pairs of ml ms will, which will give uh, this shift to be zero and here we have a table of uh, ml and ms so if you take a p orbit uh, p uh, p state then with angular momentum equal to 1 ml can take values 1 0 um 1 0 and minus 1 ms can take 
half and plus uh, minus half what we have done here is you have one and half and uh, the one can one we can be you can have one and half and you have also have one and minus half you have zero half zero minus half minus one half minus one minus half. so you have listed all these six possibilities here the reason why you have this written in this fashion is that to show that these two combinations that is one and minus half or minus one and half gives you zero shift in energy and hence ml plus ms is zero for this the others have different shift so two levels rise up two levels come down so you have actually five different states now a six different states with five different energies so equal spacing so six degenerate level splits now into five levels the degeneracy is not fully lifted okay fine that is not a problem but now um look at this we are going to have now we are going to arrive at uh, uh the reason why we are going to see why we call this as a normal z1 effect people considered it uh, consider spin to be abnormal i mean everything if there is no spin everything is fine so that is what they meant uh, by abnormal uh, norm but you look at it but we have already included a spin here so there is no reason why they should be happy and they say that this is a normal a zeman effect we will see why they still called as normal normal zeman effect now if you have a d a transition from nd to np where if you have d so that for d angular momentum is 2 so ml can take values 2 1 0 -1 and -2 and because of zeman splitting which is given by ml plus 2 ms you can have five different states here when you consider only m is equal to plus half if you consider m is equal to minus half you have additional five term five more terms then with uh, we have already seen that a p state will have six states but if you consider m is equal to plus half only so then you have three states now here now when you have transitions between these you can actually have nine lines which are allowed by electric dipole transition you can have nine lines but do do we see that don't we see that though we have nine transitions only three there are three different frequencies involved all these these three bunches there is uh, lines here one this 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 all these have same energy you can see roughly from the length of these lines and these have this bunch have a different frequency line so at, at the end you get only three lines you don't get nine lines is that fine but now if you consider here we have considered only uh, ms equal to plus half of both these states if you consider ms equal to minus half of both these states then you will see that again you will get the same three different frequencies because this this will be shifted downwards and these three states will also be shifted downwards the energy a difference will lead to same frequencies so eventually you will see that you get only three frequencies as if there is no difference if it was ms equal to half there is a transition between ms equal to half to ms equal to half or ms equal to minus half m is equal to minus half it is very it is very much the same as a situation where there was no spin at all only the spin comes into play when you, when it uh, tries to give you a shift in the energy but otherwise there's no way to actually glean the uh, influence of uh, the presence of spin and we oh, note one more thing there is a quest, question that we may want to ask our students what about transition from m is equal to half to m is equal to minus half well the electric dipole transition does not allow it there is nothing in the electric dipole interaction term that will involve that that can mix m is equal to half and minus half there is no way there is no reason why the spin should flip okay so this is called lorentz triplet because you get only three terms three frequencies and this is very three very same three frequencies appear for m is equal to minus half to minus half transitions as well so that is why this is called normal zeman effect so historically this is normal called normal zeman effect only for this reason now you can see that like just like we got for d to p transition we got nine lines but three frequency you can also work out the same thing for p to s you will see that six lines but you have only three different frequencies for this and these are normal now we let us go into the intermediate case which is a passion back effect wherein b is strong but not strong enough so that we have to, we can ignore the second uh, this term also unfortunately so okay so then we can still use ml ms basis ml ms basis in this case and uh, still still they are good quantum numbers now the perturbing hamiltonian is going to be combination of these two so let us work out 
So the energy shift in passing back Zeeman effect is given by two terms. One is the term having mag external magnetic field and which is this and the other shift is due to the internal spin orbit coupling which we represent as slow spin orbit coupling. So there are two components in the to the energy shift. It is very trivial to evaluate it. So because uh, if you evaluate mu dot s when magnetic field is in along the z direction again you get the same result which is ml plus 2 m uh, 2 ms and for this you need to play uh, you need to see this the second term more closely the other term is just what we already see so what you have is the shift in the passion back zeeman effect due to external magnetic field is going to be given by the same term mu b b times ml plus 2 ms but the shift due to the spin orbit term needs to be evaluated. It's not difficult. You see that you have a radial component of the uh, Hamiltonian, which actually uh, bothers only the spin, uh, radial. Uh, the spin, the you can actually this is actually a direct product of NL ket and ML MS ket. So, if you want to evaluate the expectation value of these two components, it makes sense. In psi of r is no way related to ML MS. Okay, it is only related to NL. Okay, so you can just split it into two terms. So if this is product of this term into this term. This we can easily evaluate because this is just a function, radial function, which needs to be evaluated in hydrogen atom wave functions. This we can do, and what we need to bother about is this term. What is L dot s? L dot s is nothing but L x s x. This, this is just a dot product of these two operators. Now, it is easy to see that. Lx and Ly and Sx and Ly can be rewritten in terms of ladder operators. So ladder operator is uh, similarly you will have the same for uh, spin uh, operator as well. Now the ladder operator has an interest. So all the terms with Lx and Sx, Ly and Ly. You can do something and write it down in terms of ladder operators only. When you do that, you can easily see the following. The ladder operators which are going to be here in present in, instead of these two terms will rise and lower ML and MS. Once it rises or lowers, it, it is going to be a, uh, when you take an uh, inner product with ML and MS. So if it is going to rise ML to ML plus 1, then ML plus 1 MS kit will not go with ML and MS because of orthogonality. So those terms will vanish. All rem that remains is just this term finally. So simply we need to bother about only this term and that is trivial to evaluate because the LZ will give you ML H bar, this will give you MS H bar. So you have ML MS H bar squared. So this is what you have here. And this particular term one can evaluate easily by once you are given the radial wave functions. Okay, so and this is what is appearing here. This zeta of R is explicitly this. We can work out this. We are not going to do this. I am just going to give you the final result here wherein these are discussed in detail in the in the video lectures as well. So when you evaluate the, after you evaluate the radial integral this is what you finally have. You don't have to worry about L this term blowing up when L goes to 0 because when L, go, L is 0 there is no spin orbit term at all. The spin orbit term is only for non-zero L so this particular perturbation shift is only for L not equal to 0 so and hence this is the uh, split uh, shift in energy due to only the spin orbit term. So when you put them together, finally, you, uh, that is, if you put put uh, them all together, we can, when you, what you do here is you do a rearrangement here to get to write down the energy of the uh, eigenstates of a hydrogen atom. So then you can get it in this fashion so that the shift is dependent on n and l and ml and ms. This is just an uh, algebra I can easily work it out and we, let us not go into that. So the perturbation energy correspond, uh, correction depends on L, M, uh, L, N and also ML, MS. Okay, so finally putting both the uh, shift due to magnetic, external magnetic perturbation and the internal perturbation. So you need to just add these two terms to get the total perturbation. So once you have this total perturbation, then you can, for any state n, n prime, you can write down the shift. This is the unput energy when, when you do not have any perturbation. This is the correction to it, first order correction to it. And similarly, this is the same for another state n. 
and you can al always look for transitions between these once you when you look for transition between these then it exposes the presence of spin so this is why uh, this this also exposes the presence of uh, spin because you will have delta ms equal to 0 and delta ml is 0 plus minus 1 so this is delta e is going to be transition frequencies so this we can work it out so now what we are left out with is the anomalous zeeman effect which is anomalous because the presence of spin is evident here now it will be evident in this in the spectra so again we now we are going to consider the last two terms but now what happens is the spin orbit the magnetic field is so low so that the spin orbit term is dominant than the mu dot b term so what we do is we can actually to begin with we can ignore this particular term and solve this identity problem by considering this to be the unperturbed hamiltonian we are not going to do that but i'm just telling you what i'm what i mean is b is in this regime b is much uh, smaller than s dot l so we can uh, we can first consider an hamiltonian which is composed of this hydrogen unperturbed hamiltonian plus this and we can solve this problem and we can get the eigen function so what happens is if you have say for example when you take only these two that is when you have a uh, hamiltonian composed of uh, and you have this then you can solve this problem and uh, you can you can treating this as a perturbation so what you have is say one you will have one state uh, unchanged because l is zero and you will have a two a state as two a two a state also unchanged but you will have a lift in 2p because in 2p you have uh, l equal to 1 and s equal to half they are together then you will have 2p 3 half and 2p half term you have you have a change in the energy you can always work out these and uh, now what we do is these are the unperturbed hamiltonian uh, un 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 unperturbed state and we will treat this mu dot b term which we have here as your additional perturbation here okay when you add when you try to add it uh, i mean you can write you because you already know the shift due to this term you can add the shift due to mu dot b term that's what we are going to see here now so in the anomalous zeeman effect you have b very very weak and now it is important to use j square as as that term because this is we know that s l dot s is uh, we know that j um, j eigen ket of j square z is j z is also eigen ket of l dot s because you can write down l dot s in terms of j square l square and s j square now so the basis is going to be different it is not no more jm basis but it's going to be uh, sorry it's no more ml ms basis now we have to work on jm basis now let us see how to do that now what we have is the full hamiltonian is this we already have evaluated the split due to the spin orbit coupling now what we need to do is to evaluate uh, the, treat this as the perturbation when when you come when compared to this because this is much larger term and compared to this so the perturbing hamiltonian here is mu minus mu dot b which is mu b again the same term l plus 2s by h bar dot b but we need to be careful here because when you consider magnetic field along z direction this perturbing hamiltonian takes this form but jm eigen ket is not an eigen ket of lz and sz operator that's when the problem comes problem is also leads to opportunities to learn more things like that's what we are going to do now in when we try to uh, evaluate this so ml and ms are not good quantum numbers so we can uh, we are we are that is why we are going to jm eigen ket but jm eigen ket is not an eigen ket of lz and sz operator so when you try to evaluate this particular perturbation term in jm basis this is what you have because l plus 2s is nothing but j plus s and since you have magnetic field only along z direction you have this j plus s written down into is just jz sz then you have b
because b is just only along the z direction and it's a dot product of this term operator vector operator with this so now it is easy to see that j m j is anyway an eigen ket of j z so when j z acts on this you get m j h bar so that is simple so you have mu b by h bar times b into m j h bar so that h bar goes away so you have mu b b m j for this term and what remains is this really a troublesome matrix element <laughs> this uh, that is we need to evaluate this z operator between m j m j is looking very humble but it is going to take a lot of effort from us to grab uh, get a grip of this so now this i we say that this particular term the split in energy is proportional to mj so we call this we put a subscript on to indicate that with j superscript and this term is uh, is dependent on uh, s operator so we have an superscript s so now this is evaluated all what is uh, required to do we done is to evaluate this particular term <coughs> okay now we can evaluate this particular term by two different ways one is to use the vector operator identities and the other one is the vector bigner eckhart theorem now this s z operator both are very powerful tools will we if you look at this particular um, matrix element s z is a vector operator prof deshmukh in the previous uh, uh, talk I, I, he explained what a vector operator is a vector operator has to satisfy a uh, commit a certain commutation relationship with angular momentum operator if it does then that is why that is what is defined as the vector operator so if you want to call an operator a as a vector operator it has to satisfy these uh, vector uh, commutation relationship with the total angular momentum operator j so these are if it satisfies then it is so you can easily verify that yes z is a vector operator so we can do that yourself uh, our, ourselves later so we can take as of now what we have is this mid uh, vector operator is sz to be evaluated and we know that sz is a vector operator so the task before us is to evaluate the matrix element of this vector operator in jm jmj basis now following these uh, definitions there are also these two identities which uh, as of now you can uh, uh, take it but you can it is very simple to evaluate this these uh, I, I, I check these identities based on this uh, uh, identity based on this commutation relationship once this is given then these two follow so you let us for, for the moment we can just take this um, these two identities and work work ahead okay let among these two i'm going to take the second one that this is what we have here look at the way i mean this is very beautiful this is very interesting though the mathematics is abstract I mean, this when you have your paper and pen doing this, it's really exciting to work with this. Yeah. Now, what I'm going to do is, remember, we are we want to evaluate the matrix element of S Z. That is now we are taking a small digression, but very relevant digression. Now, what we are doing now is we have this identity before us. We have vectors on both vector operators on both sides. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sandwich these operators in a J M J basis, uh, J M J again between J M J again kits. so that's what i have here so i have bring in a j and j bra here j and j ket here and do the same thing in the right hand side also now look at it the left hand side is trivially it can be seen to be zero because j and j ket is an eigen ket of j square operator and what you have is a commutator here so it will give two terms a uh, subtraction of two terms which are equal so this term will make lhs will vanish it, it is easy to trivially see that the left hand side is zero so what you have is this term which is now equal to zero okay now this is zero but so we take them on two sides we can always do that so this is what we have before us and you can easily see that again j square being again j m j being again ket of j square in values j j plus j square uh, it is uh, yeah j into j plus 1 h bar square so you can bring this j square out evaluating it so what you have is this j square acting on this this j square acting on this eventually will give you this h bar j j plus 1 and what remains is b plus b term and similarly here we just don't don't do anything here we just bring this term now look at it the this is two twice the uh, v operator 
So we have a two term here, two here, we just cancel them. Finally, we have the simple expression here. Now, just to remind us, we are doing something, but we want something else. And that is the following. We wanted to evaluate the SZ operator, uh, uh, matrix element of the SZ operator between these two states. By, but I assure you that once you know this, you can evaluate it. Right now, please be assured of that. But I assure you that with knowing this, so I just write this, write it down here. So once you know this particular term, you can evaluate this matrix element very quickly. So I just write it down here. I'm just dropping the J1, J2 terms. Okay, so so once you know, that once you arrive at this, we can do this, but we'll take one more digression. And uh, that is, one, though we know that once we know this bo term in box, we know we can evaluate the uh, uh, shift. We will try to evaluate it using a different approach as well. That is to use the Vigdek cast theorem. Okay, so, so you look at it, you have a scope to learn so many uh, different tools when you, when you talk about Zeeman spectroscopy. Uh, so this is what we need to try to do and uh, see this. So this is the Vigna Eckhart's theorem, which we know from the theory of angular momentum. So this is also dealt in detail in Professor Deshmukh's lectures. So what we have here, let us just uh, get, uh, look at this uh, Vigna Eckhart's theorem here. What we have here is an irreducible tensor, uh, tensor uh, operator of rank K, okay, sandwiched between the JM, J, uh, JM eigenkets. And this is equated to two terms, okay? And one of this term is nothing, uh, is actually, we call it as a geometric part because it involves M1 and M2 because that involves the geometry, the way the system is oriented in space with respect to the external magnetic field or whatever. So this is the geometric part and this particular part does not depend on the orientation of the system. So this is physical part and this is the geometrical part. And this physical part also has this vector operator in it. So this part has just the clutch quadrant coefficient. Clutch quadrant, what is clutch quadrant coefficient there? When you expand the, uh, any JM kit in an ML basis or vice versa, then the coefficients of the expansions are nothing but the clutch quadrant coefficients. Now, what you have, we need to pay, we need to go through the, do we have times? Uh, uh, I think we have till 4.50, but I can take five more. Uh, because going through the Vecna Hecker theorem, uh, we need to be, more uh, pay, patient and pay a lot of attention to this. Now look at this. What you have here is the geometric part is identified easily to be the clutch quadrant coefficient because it is nothing but the projection of JM eigenket on ML, uh, 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 M1, M2 eigenket. Now this is the clutch quadrant coefficient when you add J1 and J2, that is J and K to get J prime. So two angular momentums are added, which are J1 equal to J, J2 equal to K to get this total angular momentum J prime. Now, it is the same equation that you have. Now, what we do is when you have K equal to 1, that represents a vector operator. Okay. So, when you have K equal to 1, it represents the vector operator. And now, what we do is we replace this vector operator T with the angular momentum, total angular momentum operator. And this is what you get. That is, this is the Wigner theorem for the total angular momentum operator with k replaced to 1. Now, what we do here is we, uh, if you replace q, if you make uh, q to be 0, then you have, uh, if you, why do we do that? Because we are, we are interested, we know that this jq, when k, when, uh, when k is 1, it represents vector operator. And Q can take three values, minus one, zero, and plus one. 
when q is equal to 0 it merely is a vector operator z component of the vector operator and remember we have been behind this z operator evaluating the matrix element of z operator and hence we need to simply we need to look at our own uh, the case of interest so we just put q equal to 0 here so when you put q equal to 0 here this is what you get and simply this is nothing but jz for the total angular momentum operator because k is 1 so it's a vector operator so what we have is this particular form of the Wigner-Eckhart theorem for the matrix element of JZ operator. So this is what we are going to evaluate. So if you look at this, JZ is in uh, JM, JM eigenket is an, is an eigenket of JZ operator. So when JZ operates on this, it will give you an MH bar, okay. And this MH, uh, MH bar, but and then you'll, you'll have JM taking inner product with j prime m prime which is which will vanish unless j and j prime are same and m and m prime are same so that gives you a chronicle delta and of course alpha also have to be same because otherwise in that space you will have orthogonality will also give you a vanishing term so you have m h bar and three chronicle deltas to ensure that this is uh, zero or non zero accordingly now so this is the equation before us. This is the Wigner Eckhart theorem that is before us now. Now, this particular term is the clutch cord and coefficient when two different angular momentums are added, wherein J1, two different angular momentums, J1 equal to J and J2 equal to 1 are added. How do we evaluate this? So, the task before us is to evaluate the clutch cord and coefficient. There are tables available for this clutch cord and coefficient. You can download it. Uh, from the internet or they are also in the standard books. So the task before us to is to find out this particular term. Uh, now look at it. In this particular term, you have J1 equal to J, J2 equal to 1, and uh, that is that is what is here. J, J1 and J2 are the two different angular momentums that are added. So here J1 is J and J2 equal to 1. M1 is M and M2 is 0. Now, this is the clutch cord and coefficient for a uh, table, clutch cord and coefficient table for uh, clutch cordons of this similar type here. So, if you, what you need to do is, as, I to, as we just discussed, M1 is M, M2 is 0 here. So, you just have to look at this particular term, column, because M2 is 0. And if you look at it uh, here, you have J and J prime have to be same. Okay, so J, J and J prime have to be same, otherwise this term will vanish. There is no meaning for this. So J and J prime have to be same. That means J should be equal to J1, which means that I need to take this column, this row, and hence the value of interest of the crash cord and coefficient table is M by root of J1 into J1 plus J, J1 plus 1. So this is going to be the value for this crash cord and coefficient. You can just look at the table and take them. Okay, one can also evaluate this uh, rigorously, uh, individual terms on this column, but since the tables are available, you can just look at them and pick the clutch cord and coefficient. So, what you have is this particular term in your Wigner Cast theorem is nothing but this term. So, we are just merely write it down here. So, we have identified this to be this. So, your Wigner Cast theorem finally becomes, takes this form. So, we have identified this particular clutch cord and coefficient from table to be M prime by root of j into j plus 1. Now, if you look at this term, you have two, ter two uh, st uh, terms under square root. One is 2j prime plus 1, the other one is j into j plus 1. And uh, if you, uh, yeah, so this is what, we, by rearranging this, you get this uh, particular term. But there are there is a discrepancy, there is a difference in two different books which Professor Deshmukh has mentioned in the, uh, also talks about it in his lecture. That is, in one of the book, which is Branson and Joshain, you don't see this 2 into j plus 1 term, but that is fine because this particular uh, Wigner-Eckhart theorem is nothing but a definition of tensor operator. Okay, so one can actually observe this 2j plus 1 term in this term. So let us not bother about it right now. So wh what we need to wonder, worry about is the blue color item and the blue color box. So let us do that. So this is what we have before us. Now what I'm going to do is I, I have 
I, I write down the same uh, Wigner-Katz theorem for a different operator, which is tensor operator, which is V, and I take this ratio. Once I take this ratio, this square root term will vanish, so it doesn't come into picture. So one can now what we can do is we can rearrange this. We can take this uh, particular matrix element to the right hand side, and what we see here is two terms. One term which is not dependent on m1 or m2. The other term, uh, other term has, uh, yeah, one term depends only on the physics uh, of the operator. The other term is, an, uh, there are two terms in this. this both, there is, uh, yeah. So what we see here is this particular ratio, okay, is it, it can be is a is a constant, and you have this particular term here. So by taking these two ratios, we can arrive at this particular result. Which is what we have here. Now, what we do is, now that we have this result, remember we uh, we, we wanted to ever we had terms like v dot j, so we will evaluate this. So this v dot j matrix element of v dot j can be evaluated by introducing identity operators in between, which is uh, outer product of J m with itself. So the summation over all the bases will give you one. So when you introduce that, you will have uh, v dot j expressed in this term. Now, you know that this particular uh, term is expressed as c times this, and we take advantage of this because we have this term here. So we replace this with, which is nothing but this term as c into alpha uh, c into uh, this particular matrix element. So what you have before you is the v dot j matrix element is equal to uh, j square uh, term because what we, because this you have j dot j which is just the j square and the bit and the eigen value of j square is j into j plus 1 so finally you can arrive at uh, the projection theorem i think the, you can you can work it out if you if you have more time uh, you can work it out it's not it's not difficult uh, to get this to this projection theorem so the projection theorem is what you have here now we are very close to our result now, once we have this projection theorem, which relates any, you look at this projection real, uh, theorem relates matrix element of any vector operator to the matrix element of the angular momentum operator. So, if you substitute m prime equal to m, so you have this equation. Now, what you do is look at it. So, what you have is if you take, since this particular uh, term is valid for any value of q. Okay, you can. This is same for any value of q. So you can write it in general for a v vector, v vector operator, wherein you can stand. If you if you have here q equal to one, e, then you have you should have j q where q equal to one. So you can write it down simply like this. Then we do a rearrangement of terms. So we have this term into this j into j plus one h bar square, which is equal to this. Now what did what did we do now? We have arrived uh, at this result. And I promised you that, I assured you that once you have this, we will be able to evaluate the matrix element. All we did by taking the second digression is that to arrive at this using a big neck Eckhart's theorem. Okay? So for some time, we can just uh, get relaxed from the, uh, take, you up, take yourself away from the big neck theorem because we have already used the big neck theorem to arrive at this result. Now, to just to remind us, we wanted this. How are we going to use this result to get that is how are we going to use this result to evaluate this it's very simple look at it we have v operator and you have j operator here what about the z component of the v operator you replace v as s operator and you, this is what you get then if you are interested in the z component of this you will also be interested in the z component of this so this is the equation that you are having before you and this is what this is the matrix element that you are behind all this while and this is very uh, this is very simple this is equal to this term by this and what is this j z j m j k is an eigen of j z and that will give you m j h bar okay so what you have is m j h bar times this this is the lhs oh, sorry right rhs then you have this and we can write down j dot s in terms of j square l square and s square and all these three operators are eigen operators for J and J kits.
So you can sim uh, when j square operates on this, you get j into j plus one h bar square. When this operates on this, you have l into l plus one h bar square. This operates on this, you get s into s plus one h bar square. So this is very trivially comes to this. So finally, you have evaluated the matrix element for s z operator in j m j basis, and that is proportional to m j and uh, terms involving j l and s quantum numbers. Now, so this is just the what is this term? This is just the term uh, due to uh, the uh, this is just the perturbation due to the magnetic field. We also have a perturbation due to the spin orbit coupling. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. This is the this is also due to the magnetic field, but it's just one component, one part of it. So, so when you add both these together, so this is the shift due to the Zeeman anomalous Zeeman effect because. Of this term plus the other term which we have already derived previously. So putting these together, you get the complete uh, 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 Zeeman shift. And where this particular term is, we have already evaluated. So you can simplify this to get the shift to be proportional to m j, and the proportionality factor in includes the Bohr magneton and this particular term, the square bracket. Which we call, which is nothing but the Landau's G factor, which depends on J, L, and S. So you can see that the shift in the anomalous uh, Zeeman effect is uh, proportional to the magnetic field and M J. For so if you are given, if for a given state uh, with uh, J and L is known, all you have is shift for various M J. So. The shift is proportional to m j, so this is the simple expression that we get for the anomalous Zeeman effect. And uh, just to remind us, the the source of magnetic ma magnetic moment was both from orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum. And we can rearrange this again because j is nothing but addition of orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum. We get two terms, l plus l plus half, l plus half and l minus half. For so you can replace j for that. So this is the final. So when you when you consider coming back to this n p half state, why, why did we have p state split into two? Because of spin orbit coupling. The spin orbit coupling uh, gave a split, and we had two the region region is still lifted, and we had p half and p three half state having two different energy. But p three half three half is nothing but the total angular momentum uh, value. And corresponding to that, you have four m j values: three half, half, minus half, minus three half. And this, for this total j value, you have again m j values half and minus half. And we know that the splitting is proportional to m j. And hence, you have these uh, the the three half state, the degeneracy in three half state, which was initially degenerate in m j value. Now it is lifted, so so that every different state stays with different m j value. Will have different energy now. You can look at transitions between them. So now this was really anomalous because this cannot be uh, reconciled unless you uh, unless you take spin into consideration. So that is so then and hence if you consider the D line, which is from three half, you know, sodium line has two. You have two lines. One is from the three half to uh, N, P half to S half. The other line is from P three half to S half. But these two lines, in the presence of magnetic field, was split into ten lines, and that's what you have because of the anomalous Zeeman effect. This is it can be explained only when you consider spin into consideration. Do we go for the intensity now? Now, uh, uh, just a uh, comment here: we don't have to go into this. We to be uh, frankly, we though we use Dignacar's theorem, it was just as a tool. We We didn't ex uh, exploit its uh, advantage completely, but one can do it. Suppose if someone asks you a question, you get d ten lines in the spectra when you have external magnetic field, and if someone is asking you what is the relative intensity of these ten lines, then it really depends on evaluating. Um, it depends when you, when when you consider say line five and line ten, and suppose someone is asking you the relative strength of Uh, these two in the intensities then it depends on the transition this this transition uh probability the uh, this uh, the transition file uh, which leads to line 5 
actually depends on this particular matrix element which is initial state uh, yeah, interaction Hamiltonian sandwich between the initial state and the final state. So for this state, uh, this which you can evaluate for both these states and depending on the value of this, the relative strength of this particular term for these two states, the intensity will vary accordingly. And uh, it is really, a, you are, one has to be a massochist to, uh, to discard Wigner-Kass theorem and go ahead and calculate this particular term and evaluate the re, uh, relative intensity. But you, one can see from the lecture, Professor Deshmukh's lecture, which is, there are a few more slides on this. You can see that with Wigner-Kass theorem, you can simply see in a moment that the intensities have to be uh, equal. <coughs> So all you need to do is look at the cleft order coefficient and take the ratio of them. So I think this, uh, these will require some amount of pen and uh, paper work and I definitely encourage you, uh, I definitely would tell you to encourage your students to do this. And we'll stop here. Okay, if there are any questions. Just prior to this, we were saying that uh, you represent the state of the system by a vector in the Hilbert space and all that seems so abstract. But this is what immediately connects these state vectors and operators to observables. Because spectroscopy is all about measurements and experiments and the only way you can interpret your observations is by doing quantum theory. So it's, it's not something which belongs to the realm of abstract mathematics, but it relates directly to measurements. And the uh, family of spectroscopies which come under Zeeman spectroscopy or Starsh effect or anomalous Zeeman effect, that you can actually get the frequencies of the spectral lines, you can get their intensities using these theorems. So, so this is what we learn from Dirac that as you develop the algebra of quantum mechanics further, you connect game then to physical observations, which is what quantum theory is for. Quantum so, is normally as normal Well, it, it depends on the conditions of the condition. environment, as he uh, uh, con con conditions the of the experiment, as uh, he pointed out, because it is the strength of the magnetic field. Okay, if it is very strong, then you will observe what is typically called as a normal effect, right? but that is just a matter of terminology, not because a, anything else is abnormal. So this is normal because that's what it was considered to be normal when they did not know about electron spin. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.